Hello guys, this is Mina Azar and you are watching the surgical whiteboard. Today we are going to talk about the stomach. We will start with the surgical anatomy. There will be a lot of diagrams and details. So grab a cup of coffee and let's go. But before we start, I would like to add a side note on the difference between surgical anatomy and theoretical anatomy. The surgical anatomy of any organ is the description of its shape, relations, blood supply and so on but with a special focus on the knowledge that benefits you the most in the operating room. Also organs are classified or are divided not according to the shape, but according to their function and their pathophysiological relevance. For example, the stomach. Anatomically, it's divided to three main regions, the fundus, the body and the antrum. But from a surgical point of view, we can divide the stomach to two functional units. The proximal surgical function unit, which consists of the lower 2 cm of the oesophagus or the abdominal oesophagus, the cardia or the gastroesophageal junction, the fundus on the greater part of the body. Its main function is food storage. The second unit is the distal surgical functional unit, which consists of the distal part of the body, the antrum, the pylorus, and the first part of the duodenum. Its main function is to push the food backwards to the stomach to mix it and forward in small amounts through the duodenum to continue the digestion process. Each of the two units has its own common pathologies, like tumors are more common in the proximal surgical units and ulcers or bleedings are more common in the distal surgical units. Also, each has its own surgical approach and surgical techniques. Now we will move to the blood supply of the stomach. The stomach has a very rich blood supply, with five to six named arteries and a lot more collaterals. As any part of the foregut, the stomach takes its blood supply from the celiac trunk, which is the first unpaired branch of the aorta. Directly of the celiac trunk arises the left gastric artery, which passes medially in the lesser omentum and gives off ascending oesophageal branches and descending gastric branches along the lesser curvature of the stomach. The second branch of the celiac trunk is the splenic artery, which passes behind the stomach on the upper border of the pancreas in a tortuous course before it ends in the splenic hilum, it gives off the left gastroepiploic artery along the greater curvature of the stomach and the short gastric arteries. The third branch of the celiac trunk is the common hepatic artery, which gives off the right gastric artery along the lesser curvature of the stomach. Then it divides into the gastroduodenal artery and the hepatic artery proper to the liver. The gastroduodenal artery passes behind the first part of the uh, duodenum, branches into the right gastroepiploic artery along the greater curvature of the stomach, then it ends as a superior pancreatic duodenal artery. In addition to these five main arteries, the two gastrics, the two gastroepiploics, and the short gastric, we can add the posterior gastric artery, which is sometimes absent, uh, but when present, it arises from the splenic artery or from the left gastric artery. Its ligation during the near total gastrectomy may lead to gastric stump necrosis or anastomotic leakage. This is more common when it arises from the splenic artery, not from the left gastric artery. Another surgical relevant remark is about the short gastric arteries. They sometimes arise within the spleen material and passes backward from the spleen to the greater curvature of the stomach, within the narrow part of the gastrosplenic ligament. They represent a source of bleeding during the dissection on the greater curvature of the stomach, especially when performing an esophantoplication or a sleeve gastrectomy. Now we will take a look on the venous drainage of the stomach, which in general follows the course of the supplying arteries, with some exceptions. We will start on the greater curvature of the stomach with the short gastric veins and the left gastroepiploic vein, which both drains into the splenic vein. 
As we know, along its course behind the posterior surface of the pancreas, the splenic vein receives the inferior mesenteric vein, then unites with the superior mesenteric vein to form the portal vein. The left gastric vein and the right gastric vein drains uh, both directly into the portal vein, while the right gastroepiploic vein drains into the superior mesenteric vein. Here, I would like to add uh, an important side note on the venous drainage of the distal part of the stomach. As we see, here is the antrum and the first part of the duodenum, and between them is the pylorus. As we said, the right gastric vein drains uh, the lesser curvature of the stomach directly into the portal vein with the various small branches, and so do the right gastroepiploic vein also with various small branches and drain directly into the superior mesenteric vein. Sometimes we can notice a, a prominent communicating vein between the right gastric vein and the right gastroepiploic vein. This vein is called the prepyloric vein of Mayo. Although the pylorus can be more felt as seen as a thickening of the pyloric muscle followed by the thin wall of the duodenum, when present, the prepyloric vein of Mayo is a good landmark to determine the place of the pylorus. The vagus nerve is the tenth and the longest cranial nerve. It's named after the Latin word vagus, which literally means wandering. That's because it controls a broad range of target tissues. The left and the right vagus take course along the right and left side of the esophagus. They both communicate fiber to the posterior and the anterior esophageal plexus. From the anterior esophageal plexus arise the anterior vagal trunk, and by turn, from the posterior esophageal plexus arises the posterior vagal trunk. They both enter the abdomen alongside the esophagus through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm. The posterior vagal trunk gives off the celiac uh, nerve to the celiac plexus, while the anterior vagal trunk gives off the hepatic branch to the hepatic plexus and pyloric branch. Both vagal trunks give uh, gastric branches along the lesser curvature of the stomach, which is also known as the nerve of lethargy, and ends with the uh, crow's foot. Endoscopically, it's easy to uh, differentiate between the fundus and the body of the stomach and the antrum of the stomach. The fundus and the body are marked with the huge uh, mucosal folds and the antrum is marked with the smooth uh, appearance of the gastric mucosa. But in the operating room, on the serosal side, it's difficult to determine where exactly does the antrum uh, begin. A good landmark of the beginning of the antrum is the crow's foot. Usually, the antrum begins 3 to 4 cm cranial to the crow's foot. The vagus nerve carries the parasympathetic supply to the stomach and the abdominal organs, which, in case of the stomach, leads to increase in the HSL secretion and the relaxation of the pyloric uh, sphincter. Vacotomy operations were a good solution to the peptic ulcer disease due to its effect on the decrease of the HSL secretion. After the evolution of the proton pump inhibitors, the vagotomy operations were rendered uh, obsolete nowadays and only reserved for very few cases uh, which is resistant to treatment. The first type is truncal vagotomy, which is cutting the anterior and posterior vagal trunks around the esophagus. This leads to pyloric spasm due to the unopposed effect of the sympathetic nervous system. Here, a drainage maneuver is a must. A gastrojejunostomy or a pyloroplasty should be performed. The second type is cutting the nerve of lethargy at its origin after it gives the hepatic and the pyloric branches. This is called selective vagotomy. A super-selective vagotomy is cutting the fine branches of the nerves of lethargy uh, close to the stomach on the uh, lesser curvature. Selective and super-selective vagotomy needs no drainage maneuvers. Lastly, the peritoneal ligaments of the stomach. In this view, we can see the diaphragm, the spleen, the transverse colon, and the inferior surface of the liver after flipping it over. 
The first ligament is the gastrosplenic ligament, which is a triangular ligament between the greater curvature of the stomach and the spleen. It contains the short gastric vessels and the left gastroepiploic vessels. The second ligament is the gastrophrenic ligament, which connects the fundus of the stomach to the diaphragm. It may contain distally a pair of the short gastric vessels. But proximally towards the esophagus, it's known to be avascular, which gives the surgeon a good chance to perform bloodless dissection around the distal part of the esophagus. On the lesser curvature of the stomach, we can see the hepatogastric ligament extending to the hilum of the liver, and also the hepatodinal ligament extended also to the hilum of the liver. These two ligaments together form the lesser omentum. The free border of the hepatodinal ligament contains the hepatic triad, which is the biliary duct, the hepatic artery, and the portal vein. Under the lesser omentum in the direction of this arrow is the foramen of Winslow, which represents the entrance of the lesser sac. The last peritoneal ligament is the gastrocolic ligament, which begins on the greater curvature of the stomach, then wraps the transverse colon and continues as a free flap, which is the greater omentum. To better understand this area, we will take a sagittal section in the abdomen. The most posterior structure is the abdominal aorta, and directly in front of it lies the pancreas. Here you can see the liver and the stomach. And here we can see the transverse colon below the stomach. And behind the pancreas arising from the abdominal aorta is the superior mesenteric artery that gives off soon the middle colic artery which supplies the transverse colon. The peritoneal covering of the under surface of the liver splits around its hilum and then continue as the lesser omentum. Then it wraps the stomach and continue downward as the greater omentum. Then it winds backward and wraps the transverse colon, then continue backward, wrapping the middle colic artery and forming the mesentery of the transverse colon. At last, it covers the anterior surface of the pancreas, which is a retroperitoneal organ. One useful information is to know the direction to enter the lesser sac through the gastrocolic ligament. You must keep close to the stomach and wind directly towards the posterior surface of the stomach to avoid injury of the mesocolon. Here we can see again the possible surgical approach to the lesser sac. It's either by dissecting through the gastrocolic ligament or by dissecting through the lesser omentum. But you must take care when you dissect through the gastrocolic ligament not to injure the colon mesentery and when you dissect through the lesser omentum, not to injure the right or the left gastric vessels or the branches of the vagus nerve.